A very good evening to all of you and a warm welcome for this lecture on good governance, technology as a tool. This is our sixth lecture in the good governance series and it is my very proud privilege to welcome Mr. Kiran Darnik and thank him immensely for agreeing to deliver this lecture in our good governance series. Thank you Mr. Darnik for coming. Of course, he's a very well-known figure and needs absolutely no introduction, but I will be failing in my duty if I don't say a few words about him. Mr. Karnik is widely recognized for his work in the IT sector as President NASCOM from 2001 to 2008 and for helping to put Satyam Computers back on track as Chairman of his government appointed board after it suffered the biggest corporate fraud in India's history. Currently, he is a member of a number of government committees including Scientific Advisory Council to Prime Minister, National Innovation Council, Central Employment Guarantee Council, and National Advisory Council for Right to Education. He is involved with a number of not-for-profit organizations in the fields of education and development, and also serves as an independent director on the board of a few companies. He has authored a book on NASCOM and the IT industry and writes regularly in major national dailies. Before his last full-time job in NASCOM, Mr. Karnik was CEO of Discovery Communications India from 95 to 2001 and launched Discovery Channel and Animal Planet in India and South Asia. As founder director of Consortium of Educational Communication, he oversaw production and transmission of UGC's countrywide classroom TV programs. Earlier, he spent over two decades in ISRO and was deeply involved in the use of space technology, especially for education and development, including the path-breaking site and KEDA projects. Mr. Karnik has been conferred many awards, including the Padma Shri. He is also a life member of the International Center Goa. For chairing the session, we are very happy to have with us here Mr. Pratap Singh Rane, President of the Center and Leader of the Opposition. Thank you Mr. Rane for sparing your valuable time to be here with us. And um, I would like, I request Mr. Rane now to say a few words about Mr. Karnik. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Karnik for this evening, standing aside. I hope next time when you introduce me, just don't call me leader of the opposition, just call me Mr. Rani because I've worn many caps. <laughs> and during my long tenure in the assembly, I guess in a democracy, nothing is permanent. Although we want many things to be permanent, but we are not. I am indeed very happy that Mr. Kani is here. I in fact came to hear Mr. Kani on good governance. He is a right to save a person. And if I recall, Back in the 80s, when Mr. Rajiv Gandhi took over as the Prime Minister, he was the first person whom I saw with a computer in his office to work with this computer. Many of them felt that this is something which was not necessary, you know, in politics and in governance perhaps. The elders passed some quite facts about it. Which we have. I also bought a computer and tried to feel it. It was also a regular place. In democracy, as we see, good governance means efficiency as well as effective governance, effectiveness, transparency, and also accountability. Things which are very, very important to us. 
and this is something in which we must have if we have to have all our progress. We are going to better the living conditions of the millions but still have a long way to go in this country. People like Mr. Kani who have spent a number of years in this field of information technology and communications. Definitely it's something they can contribute and have contributed to this nation. And I, I was as eager to hear it as all of you are. We in Goa, in those days, tried to use information technology, computers, trying to get data. Government is full of data, paper and paper, and lots of data can be compressed, and we can have a, some sort of paperless offices as far as possible. This is possible with the use of technology, information technology. Address. One day I was just looking at the United States Federal Government uh, web page. So many information available in so many departments who have their own web pages, the websites, and they uh, are available there. So this is something that we have to also adopt so that. We would help our people, especially uh, when we talk about information technology, they can be interaction, we can have uh, different opinions, interaction with people, people to people, people to government. This is something I'm sure we can definitely bring about a change, a systemic change in the government. Before taking, not taking much of your time, I request Mr. Kani to come in to his lecture. Thank you very much. Mr. Pratap Singh Rani, Mr. Sahib, the gentlemen, good evening. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And Mr. Rani, thank you very much for your warm welcome. It's been a pleasure to be here. And to have you here is, I think, an exceptional pleasure for me because, you know, what better person to have a chance to interact with on a topic like this than somebody who spent so many years in the system who understands it from both the inside and in some sense the outside. So thank you for being here. You know, I must also say it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. It's a very beautiful state which I always enjoy coming to. It's so nice that every time I come here, I decide I have to come and sit down here. And then you've come to ICT and this campus that sort of sees the thing. You know, the only, only question in my, in my mind is whether I should look for a place in Goa and try and spend time and settle here, or whether I should just come to ICT and persuade Mrs. Sai that I'm going to come, you know, in 10 days a month, finding a room somewhere and come and stay here. So lovely campus and compliments to both of you on this. It's really nice to be here. Um, I want to start uh, by talking a little bit about governance and then about technology as a tool. And maybe I'll try and make it even less than 45 minutes. I see a very nice, very well-informed audience. I had a chance to chat with you some of, some of you outside. And I'm really looking forward to the interaction and the questions. Because to me, these, these opportunities are really very selfish because it gives me a chance to learn from others, to see what their point perspective is, what their viewpoint is, rather than my speaking. But I will try and set the platform by speaking for 30 or 40 minutes in terms of just my views and thoughts, and then a chance to when you look at governance, and this I've been thinking about and talked with many people, like what exactly is good governance? And the final conclusion was that you know good governance is something like love. It's very indefinable. You know it when you see it, you know it when you feel it, when you experience it. But to define what is good governance is as difficult as trying to define what exactly is love. So all of us experience governance, and sometimes we feel this is terrible, sometimes we feel this is good. And what exactly are those properties, the specifics, all these different 
Mr. Rami mentioned a few which I had down also, which are the ones that we always speak about and which are probably the necessary part of good governance, which is transparency, accountability, efficiency, responsiveness, very important because things change, people's responses have to be looked at, feedback has to be taken. These are critical elements of any system of good governance, that the governance system must be responsive. And these are things which we know, but there are many others which are indefinable. Sometimes you have these and yet think something seems to go wrong. I will come give you a few examples of those as we talk. And sometimes you did see some of these are missing and you are very uneasy. Right? The lack of transparency or the lack of accountability. And very often, the thing that many of us feel in India as citizens is the lack of responsiveness. So we get into the system and what we call broadly the bureaucracy, a bit of an unfair term for calling that big one animal there called the government. Somehow we feel they don't respond to this, nobody cares. You know, many, many examples I'm sure many of you think about, but just very recently, and you know, this is not a story from many, many years ago, it's a very recent story from literally a few weeks ago. My driver in Delhi comes from a state in North India, I won't name the state. He was telling me one of his travels, and I want to spend a minute or two telling you how these things work or don't work. He said he lives on the outskirts of what has now become a town, village, and he's been there many years, you know, typical traditional small bit of land, families there, not very productive, so they look for employment outside, but they have a little bit of land in the house. So now with modernization, he decided I must get electricity in the house. So the great thing is that he's going to get electricity. So he went ready to fill the, all the forms of the difficulty of doing those and to pay for them. And when he finally got there with all the forms, they said this is all very good. But give us proof of residence. So he says, I've been living there you know, for probably two or three generations, maybe more, in that same place. But what kind of proof of residence do you want? He said, get something, you know. Obviously not an electricity bill because you didn't have power. So can you get you know, a ration card which has your name, or a driver's license which has the address, or can you get something else which is a valid document which we can use, <coughs> maybe even a telephone connection? Don't have any of them. Look, you need something, I can't give you without that. Other option, of course, is the easier option of, you know, make a settlement, as we all know what that means to get. So he said, no, let me try for you. So he said, anyway, I, he knew driving, and he was thinking of coming to Delhi, which is why he ended up coming and going with me. So he said, you try and get a driver's license. And he went to the driver's license. They said, very good, he passed, did the test, and so on in the town. He said, fine, they said, okay, now you've got everything, but, you know, we need certain inputs from you. One of them, again, is proof of residence. What proof of residence? He went through the same story again. The driver's license requires proof of residence, which might include the electric connection. The electric connection requires a proof of residence which includes the driving license. He just couldn't get any of this. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he got into a circular thing of what to get. Finally, we asked him, so what happened? You know, how did you do it? Finally, tell me the secret. And he admitted somewhat shape basically, but I guess that's the way. He paid money and got it. So I was thinking of this as a rare aberration, there are many, many good stories about what to come to. These are stories which we all know and bemoan. But things have changed and technology is changing about them which I've come to. But just in case you feel this is uniquely Indian as many of us feel that you know, what a problem. I must tell you another story from many years ago from the Soviet Union. This is the days of the Soviet Union, not Russia. I landed there and had some luggage, so we went in, we went to immigration, picked up the luggage before customs, got the bag out, Bit of a heavy bag, I didn't want to carry it. I didn't know how far out to get into a taxi or a car. So I looked for trolleys. There were trolleys there, and unlike good thing about India, every airport you their trolleys free. In many places in the West, you have to pay for the trolley. Some of them is refundable, but some you have to pay. So I went to the trolley stand and I saw put in one room. Now, you know, as you might know in many countries, certainly in those days in the Soviet Union, you are not allowed to take local currency in or out. You can't have rubles, technically. So I said, very good, now can I change some of my foreign currency into rubles? He said, you can, you have to go outside, go through customs and go out. But if you go out, you can't come back in. So I said, how do I change it then? He said, no, you have to go out, there's no way. So, you know, you get into these sort of very circular situations in systems of governance, which somehow don't seem to work. And somehow people make their way in their own ways. Obviously, a lot of people carry rubles left over from here and there, people who don't do it, somebody borrows from somebody else. But technically speaking, it's all the legal because right? whether you're a foreigner or a, or a Soviet citizen coming back in those days, you couldn't carry rubles in or carry them out. 
So you experience these sort of strange situations in governance, which makes you wonder sometimes that, you know, what is the solution? And I mention this because before I get to technology itself, I think one of the deep lessons of governance, which when you think about it even for a moment is quite obvious, but many people, including my great technology enthusiasts, sometimes forget, is that very often you've got to set the systems of governance in place before you think of introducing technology. Now, there are cases where you can do it without that, but many, many times you have to first correct the system. What, you know, in other parlance in the business world or in the IT world, you call it business process re-engineering. You re-engineer the process before you bring in technology. Otherwise, you just bring in technology to do the same things, maybe quicker, but it doesn't change the basic steps you need. Somebody was telling me that you know you need all these forms in you know quarter to page or six to page, six, seven, eight copies of the form. In the old days you had carbon paper and you wrote and it didn't quite appear on the last copy, then you got it typed. Now he says much simpler, you get the form filled and then you go and photocopy it. So that's not really the solution. I mean you really need six copies and why? I think that's the question to ask before you begin to look at automation and technology. Otherwise, sometimes what technology does, in many cases I would say, it helps you to go much faster, but very often down the wrong road. So you reach quicker, but you reach the wrong place, and then you've got a backslide. So I think very often governance systems tend to be in that mode. And unless you correct the basics, you know the direction you're going in, you know the processes that you're doing, can they be cut down, are they all necessary? And then you can look at where technology might play a role, either in making a change or in speeding up or bringing transparency and accountability. Like you said. Now, this one example, having given some negatives, I must tell you one very good example. I'm sure there are many others in other states where they've done this very, very well. It's in Punjab. About six months or a year back, they set up a small committee, uh, not high profile, not a lot of show and publicity, and they empowered this committee to go and look at the processes of government. Not at technology, but at processes. There are a few professors from different fields, not really technology guys, there one person of technology and looked. And they made a large number of very simple changes that have frankly been quite revolutionary. And I just want to mention one of them. You know, in many, many things that we need to do with the government, they require an affidavit of some kind or other. But the affidavit, I mean, you, if you've gone through it, you realize it's pretty meaningless because you get it typed out on stamped paper, you sign it very formally, it's all typed sometimes badly because the guy who types it is, you know, the standard guy was not really great at typing. You may not have a computer, you don't know typewriter, make some mistakes, the language is bad. You suffer all that and you sign it on that stamp paper. And then you get it notarized, which is the official part that gives it value apart from that stamp, which is really just money being paid to the government, the tax. You go to the notary, he doesn't know you, and all of us have experienced this, or any of you have done this. And you go there and you might show him an ID proof. But beyond that, you might be certifying anything else which is there, that you live here, or this new age, or whatever, it doesn't you can need to sign it. Now they went through this and realized that this sort of thing was not meaningful, that in 80 or 90 percent of the cases, if not more, the notary who signed off was really not, didn't have any personal knowledge of the person at all. It was just on the basis of something the person said, or someone told, now he's a nice guy to sign it. So they did a very simple change. They said that people allow self certification and if, that, if we find that it is a, you know, somebody's done it wrongly or cheated, we will withdraw whatever it is that this affidavit is required for and there we are fine. And this was based on a good study that these people did post facto, saying that all the affidavits that had been filed, something like 95% were genuine. Because when you file an affidavit, all of us are a little careful, you are unlikely to cheat on that. Some people do, but they found at least in Punjab only 5% from what they could trace their forms. So said to catch this 5%, to penalize this 95% to go through this whole process is just not worthwhile. So let's do self-certification. And those whom we find to be deviants, we will find. They made a number of such changes which have worked wonderfully. And then, in order to speed up some of these processes, in order to put good data, in order to bring in even more transparency and accountability, they use technology. Having done these processes, and I think that's a very good example of the way we need to start with these long stories because many people, I hope I'm not one of them, are great technology enthusiasts. And technology is changing the world, it's creating wonders, almost miracles, which seem like magic if you think about it. But the fact is that unless you're clear about your objectives and what you need to do to 
just bring in technology is not very useful. That's been the experience, and we've seen this many, many years. Now, Mr. Rahe referred to Rajiv Gandhi. I think he has been a phenomenal force, very, very under-recognized in the whole process of the modernization of India, and more importantly, the Indian mindset. I don't think people have given him the due credit for that. He's the one who brought about the transformation in a big way, with the foundations laid earlier in many ways in by Jawaharlal Nehru for education. He is the one who brought this transformation that made IT what it is today. But when he brought in computers into government, because the people who were trying to help him to do it, he had this vision and he had this idea, but he, he didn't get into the mechanics of how to do and what to do. And what ended up was that in you know, 9 out of 10 cases, the computer was installed there and was kept there, it was neatly covered up, very nicely covered up there. Once in a way it was opened out almost ceremonially. And once in a way something went back and forth, and I've seen this happening literally, case after case, I'd say hundreds of cases there. You know, somebody is sitting in somebody's office in Delhi, this is in the 80s, and then he gets a call, somebody says, I sent you something, you know, on, on the computer. So then he calls the assistant, rings the bell, picks up the phone, come here, comes here. He says, something has come, see it, get me a printout, so he gets a printout. So it uses as a typewriter, nothing more. Nice form of typewriter, you get something and get a printout in the tree. So more and more it seemed that the computers in those days should have put not under some IT budget but under the head of you know interior decoration. So they part of furniture in the room, a right? table, a chair, a flower wheel, the computer. It was hardly used as a computer. But I think it brought in a change in the course of time. But what I'm trying to illustrate through this is that unless you think through the totality of it, what had happened is that two things. One is that the people who were supposed to use it were not fully trained. They were given some training about vaguely familiar, but they're not fully trained and familiar. So they felt uncomfortable with this device. Second, I think this is something which some of